Hello everybody, this is Dr. Bricker here with a review video for the final exam. So uh, the final exam, actually this is important, Wednesday uh, of finals week from 5 to 7.30. So a little bit of extra time because you're going to have to upload your work. Okay, so it, it is 20 questions. Now this exam doesn't have a sort of a built-in review test that you can kind of take a look at. Uh, instead of that, make sure that you go back over the practice exams, the actual exams, the homework sets that we've done, and look back through the notes, and also, you know, read through the chapters. If you don't have time to look at all the chapters, at least look at the summaries for, for all the chapters that we've done. Quite a bit of material. It has been, you know, 15 weeks or so, so um, hopefully you're getting started on this already. So again, there's no kind of practice test that you go over. I'm going to go over all the different concepts today and give you some hints on, on what you should uh, should look at. So uh, again, 20 questions. About half are conceptual, half are the kind where you uh, uh, show the work. Now I'm going to, just like exam three, uh, make it look like a multiple choice test so the answers will be there. But again, you have to show your work to get to get the points for that. So no work means zero points. Okay, and it's again going to look like the last one. It'll be on um, Brightspace, so you'll be able to log in, see the final exam, and then once you get started, you'll have about two and a half hours to finish it and you know upload your work just like you did on the last one. You could either type it out or you could um, you know take a picture of it and upload it. Now on the last test, I gave you um, the same amount of well about two hours and fifteen minutes. Most people actually got it done in like an hour and a half or so. So I'm I'm thinking that uploading the pictures wasn't too bad just based on the amount of time people took so um, so that's what we're gonna go with and again you don't have to upload a picture for every problem but you have to show enough work to uh, justify your answer you can't just you know have a sort of a complicated problem and then just have a line of numbers that you multiply together you have to actually show some work okay so more about that as we go through the review today and any questions make sure you email me uh, G. Bricker, hopefully you know this no, uh, email by now, G. Bricker at pnw.edu. Or if you go log into Brightspace, you can find my email address there. Okay, good. So that's the uh, foundation of what you should go through. Now, if this were a regular test, I'd say, you know, make sure you make your formula sheet. I would still make a formula sheet for this one just so you have all your information organized. And it's actually a pretty decent way to start studying. Okay, so... Um, the first chapter was chapter one, and we talked about motion diagrams, and that was just sort of, uh, and, and really first look at vectors. We just kind of had an introduction in the first chapter. The, the uh, first chapter where we actually got a lot of information is chapter two, which is a one-dimensional motion. So we looked at some, uh, lots of different graphs. We have um, position versus time velocity versus time graphs, acceleration versus time graphs. So make sure you go back through those and see what everything means. By that I mean, for example, this kind of graph means the velocity is zero. right? You're at a certain position and you're staying there. On a velocity versus time graph, this means something completely different. This means a constant velocity. And this means the acceleration is zero. Uh, you could have several different graphs, right? I mean, this would be... Uh, position versus time. This kind of graph is a constant velocity. Actually, this and this would go together, right? Whoops. So you can see it. Um, what else might you have? Something like this, maybe. And again, always look and see what's being graphed. What if you had this? So remember, the slope of the tangent line gives you the velocity. So the tangent line here is zero. So the velocity is zero. So on the way up, the, the slope of the tangent lines are positive, becoming less and less positive. So if I were to take this and make it into a velocity versus time graph. Velocity positive, becoming less and less positive. Here's where the velocity is zero. And then here, slope of the tangent lines on the way down, getting more and more negative. So that would be something like this, actually. Okay, anyway, I, I've just given you some examples. Make sure you go through and consider all the different kind of scenarios that we had before. Okay, also in chapter two, we saw kinematics equations. Let me write those down for you. I use the 
back of this piece of paper. So this is going way back. This is like the first week of school or so. So velocity final, velocity initial, plus at. Uh, velocity final squared, velocity initial squared, plus 2a delta x. And then a change in x, initial velocity times time, plus 1 half at squared. Okay, so these all assume constant acceleration. So depending on what you, what you have and what you're looking for, you, you have to cycle through these different kinematics equations. Okay, so hopefully those ring a bell. With these problems, it's good to write down what you know and what you're looking for. And then we also had a special case, uh, free fall. I'll put fall in parentheses. This just means under the influence of gravity. So the acceleration in the y direction then, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Now I wrote all these in terms of the x direction. I mean, uh, I have delta x there. But you could do the same thing in terms of the y direction. So I could have had it something like this. Velocity final in the y is equal to velocity initial in the y uh, plus acceleration in the y times time or velocity final squared in the y velocity initial squared in the y plus 2 acceleration in the y delta y or with the third one delta y initial velocity in the y times time plus 1 half acceleration in the y times t squared. The nice thing about free fall ones you know the acceleration right it's negative 9.8 unless we tell you otherwise. So you'll definitely see um, a graph problem and a kinematics one, or maybe a free fall one. Lots of information in chapter two. So there's something like, you know, 15 chapters we've gone through. There's 20 questions. So at most, there'll be two, you know, on the outside, maybe three types of problems from each chapter. So you'll definitely see a couple of problems from chapter two. Then in chapter three, we went into two-dimensional motion. Um, this was a projectile motion or motion on a ramp. Let me just detail what motion on a ramp looks like. So motion on a ramp, um, this would be the normal force. Mg is straight down. We actually weren't looking at forces yet in um, chapter 3, but uh, we have during the semester. This side here is Mg sine theta. This one, Mg cosine theta. And if there's no friction, this will just slide right down. You know, maybe there's friction back the other direction. Um, good. And we looked at this problem kind of like x direction and y direction. So make sure you go back through, look at the homework questions we did on that, any notes we have on this type of scenario. But definitely have this picture already ready to go for yourself. Now projectile motion, the difficulty with projectile motion is separating the x direction from the y direction. So for projectile motion, we have x and y. x is a little bit simpler. Velocity into x, delta x over t. That's all we have. There's no acceleration in the x direction. In the y direction, we have all the kinematics equations. Velocity final in y is equal to velocity initial in y plus acceleration in the y times time. You know, I'm writing these what you just saw up there, but that's okay. 2 acceleration in y, delta y delta y, initial velocity in the y times time, one-half acceleration in y, t squared. Again, acceleration in the x is zero. Acceleration in the y, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Now what ties the x and y motion together, again, this is projectile motion, is the time. So sometimes you have to use the y information to maybe figure out the time and then use the x um, equation to figure out how far over you go in the y direction, those sorts of things. So we did a whole bunch of problems on on projectile motion. So you know, definitely have a nice little picture like this. Go back through the problems that we did, homework problems, uh, practice tests, etc. The other special case we have is uh, when you go from one level back to the same level, and this is the overall velocity. This is uh, the angle here. This part velocity in the x, initial velocity times the cosine of theta, and then the y, 
initial velocity in the y, overall velocity times the sine of theta. Now if you notice, the x velocity is not changing, so I don't call it initial velocity in the x because it is what it is. It's just x velocity. It doesn't change. Uh, the y velocity does change. So um, it's whatever it is here. At the highest point, the velocity in the y is 0. And then on the way down, the velocity becomes negative. We actually use this fact, y velocity equal to 0, to figure out uh, several different things. So if you know the velocity in the y is 0 here, you could figure out the maximum height, or you could figure out how long it takes to get to the maximum height, multiply that by 2 to get the overall velocity. Uh, the other thing I'll say is we call this distance the range. If you remember, and we had the range equation. So the range, initial velocity squared, sine of 2 times theta divided by g. Okay, so um, you get the maximum range. Sorry, there we go. You get the maximum range when theta is 45 degrees because the sine of 90 then, because 2 times 45 is 90, that's where you would get the maximum range. Okay, so we did um, uh, some nice problems on this. We looked at the FET where we could look at the predicted different ranges for different angles. Okay, so you'll either see a, a motion on a ramp or maybe a projectile motion problem. And we also looked at breaking vectors into components. So a little bit of a trig goes along with this. You know, make sure that you're using the y velocity in these equations, not the overall velocity. Okay. Good. And then we went into chapter four. So that was chapter this is chapter three, two D motion. So chapter four is where we first saw Newton's laws. So chapter four and chapter five are all about Newton. This is where we first saw F is equal to MA. So this is chapter four. This is Newton's second law. The difficulty is you have to supply the actual forces. We also saw Newton's first law, an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by some outside net force. So that helps us solve some problems. And we also saw Newton's third law. Um, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So forces always come in pairs. Okay, so make sure you look back through this. On the force problems on the test, you're going to have to draw the free body diagram. So review free body diagrams, just the forces acting on the object. So for example, if I had a crate here with some mass, I'll just say it's two kilograms, being pushed with a force of 10 newtons this way, uh, and I've got a frictional force of, say, six newtons back that way, you might say, well, how much is the acceleration? Okay, so we have forces to complete the free body diagram, normal and mg. Remember, that's the weight straight down. If you were asked to figure out the acceleration, you could say that the net force is ma. That's perfectly good. Now, when I say they put you know, the correct information in this box here, this is from your specific problem. So I would have 10 newtons minus 6 newtons. So the net force is 4 newtons. So ma is 4 newtons. So a then would be 4 newtons divided by the mass 2 kilograms. Okay, so 2 meters per second squared. Okay, good. So again, chapter 4 was just kind of getting our, um, just getting used to a little bit with Newton's laws. Um, chapter 5 was really the application of Newton's laws. So make sure you, knew, you know Newton's second law. I mean, it looks so easy, doesn't it? F is equal to ma. This is the hard part, putting the specific forces in it. And you get those really from the free body diagram. Okay, and then we continue this idea in chapter 5. So chapter 5 is applications of Newton's laws. So this about was the time of the first test. We, we went through uh, the first few chapters, uh, all of chapter 4 and just maybe a little bit of chapter 5. That was on the first test. Okay, so again, a little bit of bleed over into chapter 5 applications of Newton's laws. So we just had more complicated problems in chapter 5. We looked at uh, weight, which is equal to mg. I already 
sort of talked about that up here. But then we have uh, frictional forces, kinetic friction, which is the normal times, mu sub k, static friction, less than or equal to the normal times, mu sub s. And then the maximum amount is when it's equal to the normal times mu sub s. Okay, so we did some problems like, uh, I'll just pick another one here. The coefficient of static friction is 0 0.5, kinetic friction 0 0.4. Remember, kinetic friction is always less than static friction. Now, if you apply a force of 10 newtons here, uh, given a mass of 2 kilograms, how much is static? How much is friction? Just to complete the free body diagram, you'd have the normal force, mg, and then some kind of friction here. So at this point, we don't know if it's static friction or kinetic friction. So the way to do this type of problem is to figure out the maximum amount of static friction. That's when it's equal to the normal force times mu sub s. In this problem, you can see the normal force is equal to mg. So we would get uh, the mass, 2 kilograms, times uh, 9.8, times mu sub s, which is 0.5. Okay, I picked a nice number. This turns out to be 9.8 newtons, right? 2 times 0.5 would give us 1, and then 1 times 9.8. So the maximum amount, let me change this. I don't want to make it close. Let me put that as 15 newtons. So this is the maximum amount of static friction. It wouldn't have mattered if I left it at 10. I just want to really emphasize this. Uh, the applied force is greater than static friction. So if I had left this is at 10, we still overcome the maximum amount of static friction. So we've overcome static friction. That means we have kinetic friction. So the kinetic frictional force here then would be uh, the normal force times mu sub k. Okay, and then same thing, mg times mu sub k. And then you can solve for that. So to do these problems, if you remember, figure out how much the maximum amount of static friction is. Compare that to the applied force. If the applied force is bigger than the maximum, then we have uh, uh, kinetic friction. Now, if this was only 5 newtons, then static friction would only be 5 newtons. It's only as large as it needs to be. Okay, so take a look back at the, uh, the problems that we did on that. Well, several different sources, homework, exam practice exams, etc. Okay, so again it all comes back to uh, F is equal to MA. Lots of different situations. We had friction here. This is Newton's second law. So look back through all those problems. We did so many different types of problems. Just really going back to this idea and the other uh, two laws. Um, with Newton's third law, if you remember, so again consider Newton's third law, um, we talked a lot about problems like uh, a truck going down a road uh, hits a mosquito. There's a force on the mosquito from the truck, but there's also a force on the truck from the mosquito. They're equal to each other. Those are third law pairs. Now, the truck is a lot more massive than the mosquito, so the truck doesn't care. The mosquito cares. The same force on a mosquito, um, the mosquito feels it a lot more than the truck feels it, right? I mean... Uh, that's what the third law is all about. So go back and review that concept as well. Okay, so lots of information in Chapter 4 and 5, but I, I, I've got confidence in you. I think you'll, you'll do fine with that. Okay, just have it all organized before the test. Okay, very good. So after Chapter 5, we actually went on to the momentum chapter, which is Chapter 9. So momentum and impulse. So there's two types of problems with chapter 9. There's the impulse problem. So J is impulse. Impulse just means uh, change in momentum. So force times time, change in momentum, final momentum, minus initial momentum, uh, MV final, minus MV initial. Lots of different ways of writing it. These, uh, this idea works out well when you have force, time, mass, and velocity. This is the kind of problem where um, you throw a baseball at a certain speed, a certain mass. It hits a bat, turns around, goes in the other direction with the speed. How long were they in contact? If you know the force, that, that kind of problem. 
So uh, take a back, take a look back through those problems. Force time, mass, and velocity. You'll see something. You'll definitely see one of those. The other kind of problems are collision problems. Okay. So here the outside force is zero. There's just internal forces. So the outside force is zero. So whenever you see collision, this is how you have to do a collision problem. The initial momentum of the system is equal to the final momentum of the system. We had different kind of collisions, you know, um, perfectly inelastic means sticks together. So take a look back at those. If you remember from the exam, we had like a, a whale grabbing onto a, a seal, something like that. So that's a, that's a uh, perfectly inelastic collision. Or there's just generic collisions. One car is going one way, hits another car. They bounce off each other. You know, you can figure out the uh, initial and final velocities. You can, well, if you know the initial velocity of everything, you can figure out the final velocities if you know, uh, you know, enough information. Anyway, this is the concept that goes along with that. So take a look back at that. We did a lot of good work on this. Initial momentum of the system equal to the final momentum of the system. Let me just give you one example. Say you have mass 1, velocity 1, uh, initial 5 meters per second. It comes along and hits another car here, velocity 2, initial, moving slower. So this would be like the initial situation. And then after the collision, you have mass 1, velocity 1, final, mass 2, velocity to final. Well, let's just say that this one becomes six meters per second. We want to know what, what this one is. I'm just giving you an example. I'm not saying this is the specific one that will be on the test. This is the kind of problem though. Nothing is sticking together here. This one's moving this way. Uh, afterwards this one speeds up. This one, you, in your mind you might think it has to slow down and it does. Initial momentum equal to final momentum. Now the initial momentum of the system, m1, v1, final, initial plus m2 v2 initial is equal to m1 v1 final plus m2 v2 final. And now you know everything except this. I guess in a, in a sense these are the sort of hard problems. You, you can't look through the chapter and figure and find the v1 final formula. There is no such thing. You've got to use this concept. Put the information together and then you come up with your own v1 final formula for this situation, right? M1, V1 initial, plus M2, V2 initial, minus M2, V2 final. So I've subtracted this from both sides, and then divide both sides by M1 to get V1 final. Okay, just be careful if you're moving to the right, the velocities are positive. Moving to the left, velocities are negative. Okay, so you definitely see some type of collision problem. I'm not saying it's this collision problem. I mean, it could be a stick-together type problem, too. But you'll definitely see some sort of collision on the problem on the test. So, you know, take a look back through those. Okay, uh, after Chapter 9, we went on to Chapter 10. This is all information that was on the second test. So, uh, Chapter 10 is the energy chapter. So, we have... Uh, kind of two, uh, two concepts in this chapter too. We have the work energy theorem. Work FD cosine theta gives you the change in kinetic energy. So kinetic energy initial minus, sorry, kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial. And kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So these uh, this concept works well when you have things like force, distance, mass and velocity. The impulse relationship that we just saw, force time, mass and velocity, this is force distance, mass and velocity. Now these kind of problems you could do using uh, Newton's second law and kinematics. You can do that, that's perfectly fine, this just makes it a little bit easier for you. What is this angle here? What's the angle between the force and the displacement? So for example if you're pulling this with some kind of rope and it's moving this way, this is the angle. Really what it gives you is this part of the force, F cosine theta, the parallel part of the force. Parallel to the displacement. That's a D there. Okay, so you can figure out the work if you have FD cosine theta. Now the network could be positive. That means you're speeding up. 
um, so uh, V increasing maybe. Our work could be negative, that means you're slowing down. I don't want this to mean like you're going upward, uh, increasing. Increasing velocity. This would be decreasing. Okay, so friction always does negative work. It makes things slow down. Um, in this example, this force would make, would do positive work. It would make the speed increase. But if you had friction back this way, the frictional force, the work by friction would be negative. Okay, so we had the work energy theorem, again, good for these types of problems. And then we had conservation of mechanical energy, or, you know, accounting for the total energy that you had. So the initial energy is equal to the final energy. We did a lot of different problems. Uh, for example, we, if you remember, we did this kind of problem. Uh, this mass is moving with a certain velocity. It hits the spring here and compresses the spring. Well, maybe how much does the spring compress? Here we were taking kinetic energy, which is one-half mv squared, and turning it into spring potential energy, one-half kx squared. Okay. So think back to those problems that we did. Uh, we also did problems like a roller coaster problem. This was on the practice test and the second test. Uh, you start up here with some kind of initial energy. Now you've got the same amount of energy here. Um, total energy here is equal to the total energy here. It's just here you have less gravitational potential energy because you're not as high off the ground, but you're going faster. So maybe you're moving here, and you have a certain height. I'll just call this one y1, and this one is v1. We're actually moving in that position. You can call this y2 and some velocity 2. So same idea, e1 is equal to e2. So you'd have kinetic energy at position 1 plus gravitational potential energy at position 1 is equal to kinetic energy at 2 plus gravitational potential energy at 2. Okay, and you could, then you have to fill in the blanks. Again, maybe you know this, this is given, this is given, the height's given. We want to figure out how fast we're going here. It's a really complicated problem if you try to do it with forces because the direction keeps changing as you're moving along. Uh, trying to analyze the whole path would be uh, difficult. Not impossible, just difficult. But what we can do is uh, instead using conservation of energy, just knowing the energy here, we don't need to know what's going on here. We're assuming there's no friction. We could uh, just know something about this position, something about this position. And then again, uh, this is the concept. You're not going to, again, find a velocity 2 equation anywhere in Chapter 10. That You'll have this concept, though, and then when you put in your details, um, the only thing, that, only thing that we won't know is this. So we'd have 1 half mv1 squared plus mgy1 is equal to 1 half mv2 squared plus mgy2. Now, in this kind of problem, if the mass is not given, remember, um, if anything's ever going to divide out, it's the mass. Mass, 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 mass. Mass in everything, the mass goes away. So the mass doesn't come into play. And then the only thing you don't know is V2. Do the algebra, figure out what V2 is. Okay, so conservation of energy. I just I gave you a couple of examples. Kinetic turning into spring potential. Here, um, we're really converting some gravitational potential energy into more kinetic energy. So that you'll definitely see a conservation of energy problem. Okay, good. So after Chapter 10, we went back to Chapter 6, which is circular motion. So um, acceleration towards the center. If you're going in a circle, there's an acceleration towards the center along the radius. That's why I put a little r there. V squared over r, and it's towards the center. Okay? We actually had this on the third test, this idea. So there always has to be a net force towards the center. This really goes back... So the little part of chapter 3, this idea. But it works well with chapter 6, circular motion. I didn't put any uh, gravitational force on the final. You know, there's no Newton's 
universal gravitational force formula, this one here. I did not put that on the test, so you don't have to worry about that. Now the actual test and the practice test, we had a car going over a bump or a depression. This could be like a mass on a string, uh, all those different sorts of problems. They all start like this. Net force, ma, it's just it's a special kind of a, it's v squared over r, and then you have to put in the actual forces here. So look back through all the, all the different examples. Let me just give you one example. Here's an overhead view of a mass on a string going in a horizontal circle. So what's the force towards the center? Well, it's got to be the tension. Right? This again, bird's eye view, you're looking down on this, and this is going around in a circle. Here, there only is one force, and it's towards the center. Tension. Um, the practice test one, I think we were going over a bump on the practice test. It was a car going over a bump. Normal force, weight. So in this problem, same idea. It always starts like this. And then what are the actual forces towards the center? The weight has to be bigger than the normal. Or you would not have a net force towards the center. And then you could solve for whatever you're looking for. Okay, so whenever you see circular motion, you know you have this and you have this. And then you have to supply this part. The only other thing to say here is the speed is also the distance around the circle, right? The circumference of a circle divided by the time to go around once. That's the period. Or you could write it as the frequency. Okay, I think that's really all for, for chapter six. It's a very specific chapter, and then when I'm not putting in the, um, Newton's universal gravitational force law and, you know, satellite motion that goes along with satellite motion, it uh, makes the chapter a little bit less. Okay. Uh, the next thing we talked about was simple harmonic motion. Or no, sorry, let me I take that back. The next thing we went on to is rotational motion, chapter 7. Okay, so this is uh, an object moving in a circle. Rotational motion is an object rotating on its own axis. So this could be like some kind of, uh, maybe it's a solid cylinder rotating through the center. So we're looking down on this again, and it's rotating. So we have all the different rotational kinematics equations. And then we have uh, Newton's second law for rotation. And we also talked to, started talking about torque in this chapter. So torque, RF, sine of theta. So if you have something like this, torque, RF, sine theta, um, if this is the force and this is R, the angle here between R and F is 90 degrees. This is where you actually uh, maximize the torque. It doesn't have to be like that. You could have like a lever arm like this. And then maybe the force is kind of like uh, um, at this angle or something like that for whatever reason. Same thing if this is R and this is F. This is uh, theta. And what that gives you is the perpendicular part of the force. So this part here would be F sine of theta, the perpendicular part of the force. It's the part of the force that actually gets this to uh, rotate. Okay. Good. So, um, so torque, it's more complicated than force. Where is the force being applied? So a smaller lever arm, if I move this force in closer, you'd have a smaller amount of torque if you left the force the same. Again, this was on exam three, this idea. Okay. So um, so make sure you can do some torque problems like this. Chapter 8, we also talk about torque. But, but here, torque gets things to rotate. So not only how big is the force, but where is it applied. So the net torque is something called uh, moment of inertia times angular acceleration. And then sometimes you have to figure out the actual torques, right? Put in the actual torques. And it's just more complicated, again, because it's related to force, but where is the force applied? So it's like chapter four and five stuff, just um, there's just more of it, right? Because it's R times F. This kind of plays the role of, just to remind you how we did this. So instead of force, this is Newton's second law, we have torque. Instead of mass, we have rotational inertia. Instead of regular acceleration, we have angular acceleration. So different shapes have different moments of inertia. 
the more mass to the outside, the harder it is to get something to rotate. Okay, so take a look back at those problems. Um, one that comes to mind is we had this problem. I think this was something like 10 newtons. This is 6 newtons. Um, you know the shape, you know the mass. How much is the angular acceleration? Something like that. I'm just giving you an example from, from the homework or the practice test. You know, here you'd have to know the mass, the radius, and I'm assuming it's a solid cylinder. You can then, you can then figure out the uh, angular acceleration. So take a look back at this sort of problem. Okay, I think that's all I really want to say about, about this chapter. I guess the only other part would be V is equal to omega times R. So if something is rotating, this is the angular velocity. So it doesn't matter where you are on this. Well, let me do a new picture. It doesn't matter where you are here. Say this is an overhead view of a merry-go-round or something. If you're at position B on the outside or position A, the angular velocity of both of these is the same. Right? You go through the same angles in the same amount of time, but the velocity at, at A, the linear velocity, is less than the linear velocity at B because you go through a greater distance out here in the same amount of time as you do here. Okay, and I did not put a rotational kinematics equation problem on, on the final. Okay, more of along the lines of something like this or something like this from this chapter. Okay, so take a look back again through the practice test, the actual third test, and uh, the homework that goes along with that. Okay, uh, chapter 8, balancing forces and torques. So I think we only did like 8.1 through 8.3. We didn't do anything with elasticity. So this is balancing forces and torques. So when I say balancing forces and torques, when you read through the chapter, you'll see that uh, something like this. Net force is zero, net torque is zero. This just means that the forces are balanced, there is no net force, and the torques are balanced. Um, kind of problems like like this problem. Let me, let me remember what this one was. Uh, this is from the practice test. Uh, it's hard to draw this problem. It's like an arm out to the side, and you're holding like a steel ball in it or something like that. Okay, so the weight of the arm itself is acting here. The weight of the uh, ball is over here. So both of these forces would make the arm rotate clockwise. What's keeping the arm from rotating? Well, there's a muscle connected here. I was called force of muscle. Um, so you can't just do this with forces. You've got to do it with torques. So if you pick this as the pivot point, you can uh, you can balance this. Actually, let's see. I think this muscle must be going the other direction. Yeah. Yep, that doesn't make any sense the way I hit it. These would make it rotate uh, clockwise. This uh, muscle here would make it rotate uh, counterclockwise. That's what's uh, holding this whole thing up. Okay, so look back at the practice test. We did a problem like this. The actual th um, third test, I think the problem was something like you had a beam here. Maybe there was a sign hanging off the edge here. Tension in the cord. Here's a hinge, and uh, we wanted to figure out the tension or something like that. So you use uh, torques. You balance torques to solve this kind of problem. So you'll definitely have some kind of balancing torques problem. You know, your resources are look at the practice test, look at the actual test, look back at the homework, look back at the, at the notes for the problems to kind of take a look at. This is the concept, though. Balance forces, balance torques. Okay. After this, we went into simple harmonic motion. So look back at all your notes on simple harmonic motion. Luckily, this is more recent. This is from chapter 14, and we just did mass on springs. Okay, the big takeaway here is this is 2 pi square root of m over k. This will give you the period. So if you have simple harmonic motion, mass on a uh, string, this is the formula, or here's the frequency, you know, 1 over the period. Okay. Um, take a look back at the pictures of 
you know, when is all the energy kinetic? When is all the energy spring potential? You have a lot of good resources on the practice test, the actual test for that as well. Okay, I don't want to say too much more. We just, we literally just did this uh, within the last, you know, a little over a week or so. Okay, so this is the big takeaway. Also look at the energy part. So the mechanical energy, one half mv max squared, one half k a squared, one half mv squared just at some generic position, plus one half k x squared. Okay, this is when x is equal to zero. This is when x is equal to plus or minus a. This is just at some wherever you're at x. Okay. All right, good. Next, we went on to um, standing waves, waves on a string, which was really chapter 15 and 16. So a little bit of 15, a little bit of 16. Um, so standing waves. Speed, frequency times the wavelength, or the wavelength divided by the period. That's the first relationship we had. So it's also equal to the tension in the string divided by the mass per length. So the linear mass density, mass per length. And make sure you put it in kilograms per meter. Okay, so that's the speed. This is the speed. Those are actually equal to each other, right? Same speed, same speed. So those formulas work well together. Frequency times wavelength is equal to the square root of the tension divided by the mass per length. That's just taking this one and this one and combining them. Now if you have a standing wave, and I'm just going to pick one, maybe I'll the third harmonic. So antinodes are the high spots. So mode three, one, two, three, three, uh, three antinodes here. Four nodes, the nodes are the low spots. Okay, so why am I showing you this? Well, you can get the wavelength from this. So it's 2L over M. So this works with this formula as well. So if I want to, I can take this relationship for the wavelength and plug it in there. You don't have to. This is perfectly good. But I can. I could take this for the wavelength and plug it into this formula. Let me actually do that. Frequency times wavelength, which is 2L over M. And then that's uh, square root of the tension divided by the mass per length. So I've just taken one formula and made it into another formula. Okay. So uh, really, for standing waves, this is all you need to know. Whatever this length is, this is not necessarily the wavelength. The wavelength is 2L divided by M. The only time that the wavelength is equal to the length is if you're in the second mode. If M is equal to 2, then the wavelength is equal to the length. Okay, so uh, I guess the other things to know is these higher order uh, frequencies are just multiples of the fundamental frequency. So the fundamental frequency is this one. Okay. All right. Very good. Now, uh, the part that doesn't change is the speed. The frequency and the wavelength change, but we have the same speed. The speed's just really governed by the tension and the mass per length. Okay. So look back through those problems. You've got some good resources again on the practice test, actual test. Okay. Now, the last thing that we've covered this week, and I know it's an odd situation with the, as not being in class. Is, um, is fluids. So chapter 13, fluids, homework 10. So I put some videos on the Brightspace course feed to take a look at the concepts with fluids from the author of the book. And uh, I did a homework 10 help video. So hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at those, read through chapter 10. There will be two questions from chapter 13 on the final. I want to give you some good hints about that. Before we do that, though, let's look at the, the concepts be, uh, in this chapter. We have density, which is mass divided by volume. Okay, so this will be kilograms per, per cubic meter. Okay, so that's the first thing that we saw in this chapter. And then we saw something called pressure. So pressure is force divided by area. So newtons per square meter. And a newton per square meter 
is something called a Pascal. Okay, so this is the SI unit of pressure, a Pascal. Now, um, there's a lot of different units for pressure. One that you sometimes see is an atmosphere. So one atmosphere is 1.01 times 10 to the 5th Pascals, or if you want to, 1.01 .01 times 10 to the 5th Newtons per square meter, it's the same thing. So if you walk outside and atmospheric pressure is, uh, if the pressure is just atmospheric pressure, you have like 100,000 Newtons per square meter all around you. We're just used to it, I guess, is the way to think about it. But it's really quite amazing when you do stop and think about it. So um, we do have pressure at depth. So when you went through the homework, you saw some problems like this. So if, if you have a container that looks something like this, um, there's going to be a higher pressure at the bottom than at the top. Um, the notation that we used was this. So if you get this at the top, pressure at the bottom, the pressure at the bottom is equal to the pressure at the top plus um, rho, that's the density of the fluid, times g, times, um, I'm just going to call it y here, whatever this height is. Okay. So this is the actual uh, pressure that you would have down here. It's equal to really the, the pressure by the whole column of fluid above your head. So pressure at depth. The, the greater depth you are, the greater the pressure will be. Okay, so um, this is something called, uh, this would be like the, uh, if you say you had a gauge, if you took a gauge, like say you're some kind of a spring-loaded gauge and you just had it here, the pressure would read zero. It already takes into account atmospheric pressure. Okay, so uh, down here, you're taking into account, you know, uh, what it would be normally plus this part. So this is the actual absolute pressure. That's what I'm trying to say. Absolute pressure. This part plus this part. Okay. This part is just the gauge pressure. You know, what's, that's what's uh, absolute is in, in addition to atmospheric pressure. This is just the atmospheric pressure here. Okay. So a little bit, maybe more information than you need, but if you want to find pressure at depth, it's pressure at the top plus rho gy. And then whenever you're at the same level here, you have the same pressure. So anything at the same depth is the same pressure. It doesn't matter the, what the thing looks like. I mean, you could, have, uh, you could have a container that looks like this. Or you can have a container that has got this V shape. Or you could have a really wide container. And say these are all connected to each other. this. So here's a container, here's another container, here's another container. They're all connected together. You start filling them up, maybe to this height. Something like that. You've, you've filled this up. Um, the pressure at, here at the bottom is the same as the pressure here at the bottom. Same as the pressure here at the bottom. It doesn't really matter the, the, uh, the shape of these things. Okay, if they're fi uh, filled to the same height, they've got the same pressure. Okay, and then another uh, concept from the fluid dynamics section is this idea of buoyant force. So the buoyant force is the density of the fluid that's displaced, the volume of the fluid that's displaced, uh, times g. So the density of the fluid is whatever um, the density that you submerge the object in. So if it's water, density is a, a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. The volume of the fluid that's displaced, so say you put an object halfway in, submerge half of its volume, then the volume of the fluid that's displaced would be half. If you completely submerge an object in a fluid, then uh, the volume of the fluid that's displaced is the same thing as the volume of the object, right? And then... Uh, again times g. So here's an example what we can take a look at. So in this picture I have uh, some kind of mass hanging by a string submerged in water. So from what we did before you know that there's tension up, there's weight down, 
the new thing we have now though is buoyant force. So buoyant force is always acting up here too. So in addition to tension and weight, now we have buoyant force. So if you submerge an object in a fluid, the tension is going to be less than if you just had the object hanging in the air. Okay, so we've, we've done this before. Tension plus buoyant force. I say we've done this before, just balancing forces. Tension up, buoyant force up is equal to the weight down. And the weight is just equal to mg. Now there's a new way I can write the m if I wanted to. Remember, density is mass over volume. So then the mass would be the density of the object times the volume of the object. So I can put that in here for, for, the, uh, for the mass of the object. The buoyant force, again, it's the density of the fluid, volume of the fluid, that's displaced times g, and we still have tension. So you can see that the tension here is going to be less than it would be if you just had it in air. Okay, so you'll see some kind of buoyant force problem probably on the final. Either this sort of problem or, you know, go through homework 10 again. In homework 10, uh, there's a problem where uh, I think it's a hippo standing on a scale. So the scale would read less because the hippo is submerged and we've got the buoyant force up. Okay. Okay, then the other part of uh, fluids chapter is fluid dynamics. And we've got something called volume flow rate. So Q is volume flow rate. So this would be um, the volume, which is in uh, cubic meters, cubic meters per second. And you can see from the units it's velocity times area, velocity is uh, meters per second, area is meters squared, so you get the volume flow rate. So Q is volume flow rate. So if you have a, a pipe like this, and you've got a cross-sectional area here and a cross-sectional area here, if fluid is flowing this way, um, the same volume that goes in here has to be the same volume that comes out. Um, the thing that changes when the pipe gets narrower, the fluid speeds up here. So the volume flow rate here is going to be equal to the vol volume flow rate here. And by cross-sectional area, if this is just a regular tube, um, this is a circular cross-section. So the area of a circle is pi r squared. So this area would be uh, pi r1 squared, you know, if this is r1. And this uh, area here is r2. So these problems work out where you have Q1 is equal to Q2. So V1 times A1 is equal to V2 times A2. Just be careful, it's uh, the area is pi r squared. So you'd have pi r1 squared. Over here you'd have pi r2 squared. The pi's cancel out. So you get V1 r1 squared is equal to V2 r2 squared. So notice this radius is squared, this radius is squared. So if this radius is half as much, as this radius, the fluid actually comes out four times faster. Okay, we also have Bernoulli's equation in uh, chapter 13, but on the final, I'm just going to put uh, a volume flow rate problem like this on it, so you won't see Bernoulli's on the final exam. So again, with chapter 13, you don't have the benefit of having had a test over it yet. Really, the only thing you have is, you know, look through the chapter problems, read through the chapter, do homework 10 and you'll see a lot you'll see some problems like this okay so no Bernoulli's pay attention to the uh, to the buoyant force one as well okay excellent so um, the final again is Wednesday from 5 to 7 30 if you have any questions send me an email uh, we can set up a zoom meeting if you want to We've got a few days to go hopefully you've been um, studying as you go Physics is the kind of thing where you can't just really learn it in the weekend before, so you've put in a lot of time already. Now it's just a matter of kind of uh, going back through and refreshing uh, what you've learned. So again, it is 20 questions, probably about half conceptual, half with numbers, but again, make sure you show your work. All right, hope to talk to you soon. Bye-bye.